be in Digital Experience Cloud Division. Uh, our talk is about real-time identity graph product uh, built on top of Link, of course. And this talk is organized as follows. We'll start with what do we do at Adobe, in particular in Digital Experience Cloud, to set the context. Why are we even doing anything with Flink, right? And then uh, we'll go on to explain our solution, Identity Graph, and uh, the way it worked before we moved into real-time version, and why we had to move to a real-time version at all, right? Then I'll explain uh, when we set out to do a real-time Identity Graph version, we went through a methodical data-driven ev streaming evaluation process. And of course, Flink came out as the winner. And I'll explain how we went through that process and pick Flink, pick, uh, right? And then next, I'll explain how our solution works on top of Flink, the design, right? Finally, I'll end with the lessons we learned building real-time identity graph on top of Flink, right? So without further ado, to start with, what do we do at Adobe? In particular, you might be wondering, what are we doing here, right? We are uh, sort of creative types uh, with Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, After Effects, and so on, right? And in fact, this might be the only company with an Oscar to its name here, right? So you may be wondering, what are we doing in Fling Big Data world, right? So in, in fact, that's, uh, this is not all we do. We actually, in particular, Adobe is divided into three main divisions. Of course, the Creative Cloud. This contains Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects, and so on, right? The tools you're familiar with. In the next cloud, or next division, is called Document Cloud. Document Cloud is PDF, Forms, Adobe Signs, and contacts with big government agencies like uh, IRS, California government, and so on, right? Then comes the third cloud called Experience Cloud. We build on top of core strengths our core strengths in Creative Cloud and Document Cloud, and we provide very rich set of experiences on top of this cloud. And so dwelling a bit deeper into this cloud, in fact, this is the cloud our solution comes from. Right? In Adobe Experience Cloud, a foundational product is called Adobe Experience Manager. So to give a motivation of what it is, right? Uh, to set the context. Say you go to a Fortune 500 site randomly, right? That's a good bet. It actually that site is built on top of Adobe Experience Manager. Here I have picked Ford, right? It's built on, on top of Adobe Experience Manager. How do you know? So if you go to a site called whatcms.org and put in a site of your interest, it should tell you what CMS system it's built on top of. In this case, you can see it's built on top of Adobe Experience Manager, right? then you might still be wondering what exactly is this Adobe Experience Manager, right? Let me illustrate with an analogy. In earlier times, when we wanted to track our bugs, right? We used to install Bugzilla in-house and hire a few engineers and to manage and maintain it and so on. Nowadays, none of us do that. Most of the time, we get a license from Jira and we let the good folks at Jira manage and maintain our bug database for the technology for us, right? The concept of Adobe Experience Manager is very similar. Right? Instead of every company building from scratch their uh, site and hiring a lot of engineers and designers and so on, you could simply build uh, your site on top of Adobe Experience Manager and let your designers, who you need anyway for a professional high quality website, uh, manage and ma manage this website. In particular, they are already familiar with tools like Photoshop, Illustrator, our Creative Cloud strength. Already, uh, they're very familiar with those tools and it provides the same nice interface. And they can simply drag and drop their assets like photos and videos and build this professional, high quality looking website. The one uh, like the one I showed for Ford, right? Very quickly. And this is the our foundational product in this third cloud called Adobe Experience Cloud. Right? In, on top of Adobe Experience Cloud, we provide a rich set of services. This is our foundation, right? In particular, personalization, bucketing, analytics, the standard, all the standard website feature. And with the acquisition of Marketo, we even provide e-commerce and so on. And this is where our technology comes in. 
our technology, of course, is called identity graph. This provides a common core technology for many of these rich set of services. Remember, uh, to summarize what I said so far, at Adobe, we have three clouds, Creative Cloud, Document Cloud, and Experience Cloud, which provides this rich set of services on top of uh, this cloud, uh, the our core strengths, right? And in this cloud, the foundational technologies, of course, the Adobe Experience Manager. On top of that, we provide a rich set of value-added services, and one of the core technology powering this set of services, Identity Graph. So you might still be wondering, what is uh, this Identity Graph? Let me again illustrate it with a motivating use case. Let's say you have been planning to buy a car for some time, right? So uh, at lunch, you had some time, and then you went to Foresight. Uh, of course, uh, built on top of Adobe Experience Manager, like I mentioned earlier. Right? And you uh, configured this car, you picked the blue color, 17 inch alloy wheels, moon roof, and so on. Right? Now you got this very nice configuration, you spent 20, 30 minutes, and you're all excited. Right? Now, in the evening, you actually go to a restaurant with your friend. Right? And you're all excited, you want to show off this car. Right? Unfortunately, like all of we uh, of us do, you didn't take the laptop you only have your phone with you right so now let's say you load up your uh, you load up ford in your phone right and it comes with this bland kind of default configuration right the black color default uh, wheels and uh, default configuration and so on it's not a great experience right instead in, in particular it has at least three problems i want to explicitly point out to motivate what we are doing right for one, it, to get back the same configuration you had earlier in the day, you have to spend another 20, 30 minutes right? uh, getting back the same configuration. That is your first problem. And remember, you're in the restaurant. And the second problem is you don't even exactly remember all the steps you did to get this nice car configuration. right? So it's not like uh, we all go and uh, particularly this user right, who may not even be a, an engineer goes and ch checks in this configuration into a source of repository, right? So that's the second problem, right? The third problem, which is arguably the most important problem, is while you're sitting and doing all this for 20, 30 minutes, your friend is going to be completely pissed off, right? So that's not going to be good for you, right? So instead, when we load up, in particular, before I even go on to the next slide, I want to point out one important thing. None of us go and Log, goes and log into actually any of these sites before doing this configuration. So you're not logged into laptop, you're not logged into mobile, in particular to Ford site, I mean, right? So now, instead of this bland configuration, when you load up, if you are the configuration you set up earlier in the day, the blue color alloy wheels and moonroof and all the nice configuration you did, if it comes up by default, this is a great, a great experience for you. And it leads to a pleasant and productive conversation with your friend, right? You are all happy, right? In particular, uh, it saves a lot of fame for you, the user, right? And over, and we have more than half a billion users uh, in North America alone, which means, means we are saving a lot of time summed up over all of these users, right? In addition, it's good for Ford company as compared to its competitor who may not have this technology because they will likely end up selling this car, right? Because user just had a very nice experience. So this is the motivating use case behind our technology. Remember, you're not logged into either of these devices. And then we could still transfer over these contacts very, very safely, safe in the sense of a privacy point of view. I'll come to when I explain the technology, why it's pretty safe, right? And this is what I call personalization without login, right? This one use case. Another use, use case you can use this for is actually an ad experience. Say uh, you don't like a particular ad in your laptop and you click and don't show this ad, right? It would be much nicer that a preference is respected in your mobile and all other devices automatically, right? Without this technology, you have to go and do this don't show ad, don't show ad in each of these devices. With this technology, right? With this technology, all you have to do is do it in one device, and then this thing carries over across the board, right? which is nice. 
to take another example right say typically advertisers have a cap on this, uh, these ads they show to the same user right just so that they don't want to annoy the user and lose the business right so if they have a cap of three times a day and then without this technology you have to do three times a day in your laptop three times a day in your mobile and so on right here with this technology our identity graph technology you can just simply do it three times per day across the board right across all your devices which is not much more pleasant experience right now moving on to the third example remember i mentioned analytics as a value added service we provide and you care about how many people visit your site not exactly how many devices visit your site right so we can actually provide people based metrics in addition to device metrics right as a final example let's say uh, you can even improve the privacy aspect itself. Let's say you opted out of, you went to a site and you opted out of a, a, some persuasion services, a sub service in that site. And that preference, particularly if the site want to respect your privacy better, right? They can actually take, a, take that opt out signal and then they can respect in all your devices and not do a personalization for you or the sub service for you, right? Which is arguably, um, much much better way of respecting your opt out and privacy uh, privacy aspect right so this i hope this gives you a motivation behind why we do this technology right and this technology powers multiple of our value added services and i have given you a glimpse of all the use cases which can be powered using this technology right now going to the Take, uh, sort of we are switching gears and going into the technology aspect okay so how, how do we used to do this technology right um, in particular we used to have what is called batch identity graph batch so, so that i can contrast it with uh, the streaming aspect right in the batch world we used to like i mentioned we used to process like more than like half a billion users and two billion plus devices right and we used to do this every week. And the way this works, we have our partners. We have Adobe Experience Cloud has tie-ups with all of these partners because of Adobe Experience Manager and so on, like I mentioned earlier, right? So we get these events from Ford, Home Depot, and so on, right? All these events end up in our S3 event logs bucket, right? Now, every week we do this, we take up all these event logs and we use this humongous batch spark process and then we crunch this whole thing and then we update the device links we produce into the graph db right when later on when i actually explain real-time identity graph i'll explain how exactly this works i don't want to repeat it twice so uh, wait for a uh, few seconds or a few minutes to, uh, to understand how exactly this device linking works right so in summary we have this event logs we do a big batch processing uh, and we deduce these DV links of devices belong to the same user and we update it into GraphDB, right? Now, like I mentioned, we build this, we used to build this every week before we had the real-time identity graph, right? We build this once a week. In particular, what this means, do you realize, like, in our, remember my forward use case uh, where you had a pleasant conversation with your friend? You have to wait for a week to go to the restaurant with your friend because we're only doing this once a week, right? Which is not very ideal, right? Now, the next uh, next problem is we built this whole thing every time and it's quite a bit of data. Uh, it's 40 terabytes per day and six months of data we crunch every week, right? That's a lot of data and we keep having this performance issues in particular spark uh, since it wants to keep everything in memory it keeps running out of memory right once in a while so we have to keep babysitting this right in addition there is another important problem remember at the heart all of this is our algorithms right and that's our magic secret sauce right this gets to only because we had to do a lot of pre-aggregation at daily and hourly level because we have to manage this much of data right so this means uh, this means our algorithms get to only look at this pre-aggregated data and it cannot be as effective as it could be if it were to look at even level fine grain data right that's pretty important for us because that can improve our uh, accuracy of our algorithm a lot right so because of all these reasons 
we set out to build the real-time identity graph. That's the latest reincarnation and near real-time version uh, built on top of our streaming framework, right? In particular, when we started out to build this real-time identity graph, the one of the uh, tasks we set out for ourselves is to pick a nice streaming framework. Right? And given that we are putting our life on it, so to speak, right? Uh, we went about it in a very methodical and data-driven way. Right? In particular, we picked for uh, we uh, did some pre -home homework and we shortlisted four frameworks, right? And then for these four frameworks, these spent quite a bit of time actually studying it in a methodical and a data driven way in particular we picked some static data of qualitative parameters but again based on data right and some experimental parameters and we measured all these four frameworks along these parameters right of course uh, i don't have the time to go into that level uh, the, the full level of detail so we have a nice tech blog adobe tech blog if you search for adobe and flink that should be one of the top results right apart from this talk itself right so you should you should be able to get the full level of details if you're interested in that blog right to give you a quick summary here and just picking a couple of parameters uh, because that's all the time we will have right to pick the maintainability, right? We, Adobe operates in both AWS and Azure, which means we don't want to be tied to one particular cloud framework. That would hurt our maintainability, right? And so this straight away eliminates frameworks like Kinesis, right? We don't want to be tied to a particular cloud provider, right? So that's an one aspect of maintainability, right? To pick another parameter, right? The framework maturity. These are keep in mind. These are static qualitative parameters. We collect some data and we take uh, for we convert all of the, this data and the performance into a grade for each of this framework. Okay, so it's a pretty nice and methodical data-driven uh, process, right? We as much as possible we don't want to bias and use our intuition to pick anything, right? We want to use our data, right? So now. With mature, so this, this parameter, right? Maturity. So we looked at how well this framework is adapted, right? Uh, how well the support is, how good overall, how many companies are using it. In particular, we looked at a few of these parameters like the contributor to open source community, Stack Overflow questions, Stack Overflow vouchers, and so on. And for all of these frameworks, In, this is data as of, I think, November 2018. It's a bit old. So if anything, it, like yeah this numbers should have grown at least for flink right uh, so we took all these parameters uh, these sub parameters and we assigned a grade to uh, all of these frameworks right one grade to each of these framework based on these parameters right these are static qualitative parameters again grades are still based on data right then we have we, we looked at uh, the experimental parameters right latency throughput and reliability. For latency, we picked a million of our events, right? And we passed this through all of these frameworks repeatedly. And then we measured aggregate parameters like min, max, mean, standard deviation, and so on. Again, we converted the performance of each of these frameworks into a grade, right? That's for latency. Now, for reliability, we ran this framework with our data for a week. Right? And then we measured how many times we had to babysit and how many crashes and uh, restarts this hand. Right? And then we converted this into a grade again. Right? At the end of this process, this uh, study, right, the, this methodical uh, data-driven evaluation, the final grades came out this way. Of course, since we are here, and uh, I should say, like, and uh, Flink actually came out on top as a platform of our, our platform of choice, right? In, in fact, Flink did very well across the border, across all of our parameters. And then we didn't keep in mind, we didn't use any of our intuition or any of our biases. We tried to, uh, because that's not good for our business, right? So we tried to keep away from that as much as possible and use methodical data-driven parameters as good computer scientists and good engineers, right? So. It, it came out this way. And again, like I mentioned, all the details are in the, 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 our nice blog. So feel free to take a look at it when you get time. One Im uh, Before I move on, one important point I want to mention is, uh, if you look at Spark, Spark got pretty bad grades 
in experimental parameters. And you might be wondering why, right? particularly if you know a bit about Spark. Right? In particular, it's because of Spark streaming model as compared to native streaming models like Flink or Storm. The way Spark streaming works, it collects few seconds of data in the source, right? And then it converts into a mini batch and sends off that batch on for down pro downstream processing to its standard Spark batch processing engine. It's just the only difference is it's a mini batch. Got it, right? Now, the problem with uh, that is, so if say the downstream processing is overwhelmed, it has no way of telling the upstream components, what we would call in fling back pressure, right? There is no way to uh, communicate back pressure and throttle down and smoothen the load, which ended up being pretty bad. We didn't know this, of course, when we started off. Right? In our experiment clearly revealed that this problem in Spark, and then actually that's the reason Spark has pretty bad grades in experimental parameters, right? So in summary, we picked Flink as our platform of choice to put our life, so to speak, right? And we built our real-time identity graph on top of Flink. Now, moving on to the next section, the real-time identity graph itself, right? How did we, uh, how does it look on top of Flink, right? At a higher level, it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, like, it should, like it should, there should not be too complicated an architecture, right? We have a message queue, or what we call pipeline, right? and then which uh, has all these partner events I mentioned, right? And we, the Flink source pulls these events into a set of processors, right? After we do the processing, it updates all these graph DB updates into our graph DB as a Flink sync. In addition, we have an important, another important component called metadata store, or what we call working memory, where we keep all our intermediate scores, historical counts, and so on. All right. So this is pretty important for our computation because we have data in the graph DB, and we need quite a bit of historical metadata for us to do this computation. Right. In addition. This metadata read store serves another important purpose for performance, which I'll come to in a later section. So keep this in mind, right? Now, digging a bit further into processors, right? All of this uh, at this level should be pretty straightforward, right? A bit further into the processors themselves, right? This is how the processing itself looks. We have two chains, right? The top chain and the bottom chain. The top chain is called deterministic path, and the bottom chain is called machine learned path. Right? Now, moving on to the deterministic path, it has two key pieces of information. The device ID, which is a device ID unique to every device. Okay? And in addition, we have another important piece of information, what we call uh, the user login hash. right? To illustrate this, say uh, a user went to Macy's site and logged into the Macy's site from her laptop. Then, as our partner from Macy's, we get two pieces of information. Of course, the device ID and uh, device ID because we have this uh, integration with uh, these partners, right? So I won't go into that part of the magic. So we do get this uh, device ID. Keep in mind, we have integration via experience manager and things like that. Right, we get this device ID and we get this login hash. Once say this user went and logged into the Macy's, we get this login hash, which is unique within the context of that partner to that user. In this case, to Macy's. So now we have these two pieces of information, this device ID of the user and the login hash. And keep in mind, it's just a hash. We don't know anything about this user. In particular, we don't have any personally identifiable information about this user, just this hash. Then later on, let's say this user goes and logs into Macy's from her mobile, right? Now we have the device two on the mobile and then the same login hash because this login hash is unique for the user within the context of that partner, right? Now you can see we can deduce, we have, since we have this common login hash, we can deduce device one and device two belong to the same user. We don't know which user it is, right? definitely no personally identifiable information, but we definitely can see these two devices belong to 
uh, the same user. This is the gist of the deterministic path processing, and it's pretty accurate, as you can see, as long as we have this magic login hash. Right. In the deterministic path itself, we build an edge out of these two pieces of information. And ours is mostly graph processing and quite a bit of vertex and uh, vertices and edges. Right. We do quite a bit of processing on top of this. Right. And the, uh, we produce this, some of these graph DB updates and we, which we update into our graph DB sync. Right. So this is, like I mentioned, it's pretty accurate, but there is obviously one problem with this. Uh, not all events have this hash. And which means our coverage or recall is not as good as we would like it to be, right? Which is a problem, right? So that's why we have the second path, our machine learned path. This also has two key pieces of information, right? We have the device ID, which is the same, and we have IP. We, you do use uh, other parameters, but I don't have the time to go into all kinds of parameters. So just pick IP, right? We have these two pieces of information. And then we build the edge on top of this in machine learning path. And then we do quite a bit of sophisticated machine learning processing. Again, I'm sorry, but we don't have the time to go into that processing because that's not the focus of this talk, right? To do, we do all quite a bit of this processing and we end up with uh, the stats the information about this device links, which is statistical in nature, right? Because we are not 100% sure. So we take this information, we use some merge strategies to reconcile this information with uh, our deterministic path and graph DB, the, our existing information in graph DB. We do this merge process, right? And we get our final output, right? At the end, the output is, could be characterized like this. It's an equivalence class. It's a bit mathematical, but it's pretty accurate uh, if you like it, right? So it's uh, it's an equivalence class for every user. So it, it's an equivalence relation with the equivalence relation itself being if two devices are related, uh, to two devices are uh, be belong to the same user, they are related, right? And then every equivalence class identifies a user. So we have a set of devices, just to summarize again, if it is quite a mouth mouthful, right? We have a set of devices. It's divided into equivalence class of devices, one equivalence class per user, right? And then equivalence class is identified by the, the two equivalence relation itself is identified by two devices belonging to the same user, right? That's all, right? And keep in mind, we have absolutely no information about the user, uh, no explicit information about the user. Everything is latent, right? All we have this this equivalence class of devices, and we have absolutely no information about the user and definitely no personally identifiable information. So this elegantly captures this device relation and we can do all the magic I explained, all the use cases, right? Personalization, ad experiences, uh, analytics, and so on, right? So this is pretty much our final output. And then we run like 25 billion plus ev events per day, right? And in production, and our production itself is running on Kubernetes. Right, and then we do quite a bit of processing on top of Yarn and uh, Azure HD Insight as well for things like uh, quality evaluation and uh, historical analysis and so on. This is, is pretty much how our solution looks. Now, moving on to our last section, right? Our lessons learned building our real-time identity graph on top of Flink. In particular, quite a bit of these are performance lessons because ours is like a high performance high scale solution. And that's what we thought should be the most useful to the listeners because these are the one where we put in quite a bit of effort, right? The first one is, of course, um, we see quite a bit of duplicated events, right? We keep seeing uh, device edges and they, they, they particularly in a short burst of time, it's uh, they use because of the user activity. We see quite a bit of duplication for the same device, right? So what we do is we use a tumbling window, and then uh, at the end of the tumbling window, we just process this edge once, right? This saves quite a bit of processing for us, and then improves our efficiency. And in fact, so much so that we use this tumbling window all over the place. If you look in the topology, in addition. A related optimization caching, right? So remember, I mentioned that we we use metadata store for our work as our working memory. It serves another important purpose. In particular, 
uh, we when an edge comes in we look up into this radius store or in this metadata store to see to deduce whether we can optimize on further downstream processing and very expensive graph db updates right our, our graph db updates are pretty expensive as compared to other processing right so this saves a lot of effort for, a lot of computation for us so much so that in fact it cuts down the processing by a factor of thousand so uh, i would highly recommend this optimization particularly if you can model your problem in the right way this say this is one of the most important optimization we did in the, and probably the single uh, although might be tangentially related to fling this is one of the key lessons i would say in this uh, talk moving on to the next one the back pressure remember i mentioned this in the context of the spark getting bad grades in streaming uh, frameworks evaluation right this works great in flink very nicely in flink uh, so now the reason we are thankful we picked flink All right say let, take uh, illustrate it with an example right say in our ml processing the scoring is very slow right at this point at some point in time right this component communicates it back to the upstream component automatically and then asks it to slow down throttle down and smoothen the flow and flink does this very nicely automatically so so that actually it keeps making progress without the whole thing killing over right which is very nice so uh, in addition it has flink has a nice ui for back pressure which uh, lets you look at it and actually do the optimization for, for all your components right in fact it sometimes it gives you very non intuitive insights based, based on this data which is actually quite useful after we optimized our uh, typical components the external dependencies like graph db and uh, redis and all we still saw back pressure when we were running and then we uh, investigated and then we realized actually our our even parsing code uh, surprised to us right? even parsing code is actually taking quite a bit of time and adding additional a lot of additional latency so we actually and then when we invested we realized actually we are doing a dns reverse lookup and inside the code and then when we optimized it to do a local look lookup uh, it actually improved the performance for us quite a bit so who knows if you uh, investigate uh, through this mac pressure you might get some very quite insightful uh, information moving on to the next one right the checkpoints this was mentioned in key uh, keynote as well right uh, and particularly if you're planning to use checkpoints i would recommend attending that friday talk because with checkpoints and before even going into checkpoints right there are typically two kinds of workflows right the guaranteed workflow and non guaranteed workflow in non guaranteed workflow so you typically optimize for high throughput and you don't care about like losing a small percentage of your events we do most of our workflows are like that but there are some variations of our workflow where we cannot afford to lose events where you need to use checkpoint basically take a snapshot and uh, it lets you recover from crash and so on right but it comes with a cost it's pretty expensive because you have to keep doing this checkpoint periodically this also means uh, this also means your throughput would be lower in addition we have uh, seen job manager running out of memory a few times right in addition there is another important problem you should be aware of your using checkpoint is it implements the global checkpoint which means if one of your path is slow this is important if one of your path is slow all the paths are going to be affected by uh, because all of them cannot get past that this was mentioned in the key point i don't know whether like uh, you got the importance of that point we painfully learned that right so which means uh, our even lag, processing lag overall will go up right uh, so uh, so there is a the good thing for this is there is a nice feature coming in staggered checkpoint or an an align checkpoint which is actually uh, i hope it's pretty nice we ourselves have not evaluated it, so i cannot watch for the performance so but uh, if you are planning to is the recommendation on checkpoint is if you can avoid it and get away with your cursor and uh, offsets and so on uh, the message queue offsets and so on all the better but if you uh, cannot you have to use it you definitely should consider looking at the anal analyze checkpoints and do attend the talk that should be pretty useful before you bring in checkpoints going on to the next point right so remember i mentioned we run it in production 
with this 25 billion plus uh, events flow and we also need to run it in a different mode where for quality evaluation in particular we have to run the workflow and compare it with our old system to see uh, how our precision recall and so on measure remember we are quite data driven like whether it's in our evaluation and, and we don't want to just pat ourselves in the back just because we implemented it in flink right so we have to compare it with our our old system and actually certify to ourselves like uh, this uh, this very competitive so all we had to do the, the nice thing with fling is all we had to do is replace our message queue source with an HTFS source and we could keep the, all the rest of the workflow and it works great right and it, this lets us do the quality evaluation historical analysis in some case even debugging right and all we had to do for this is uh, we just used the Flink Hadoop compatibility jar and use this read sequence file function. And gave, we gave it a folder. Uh, and then it goes through all the subfolders and then excludes things like da done files and so on. And it nicely gives us the even the same format, which means we don't have to change anything else. And we get the, this nice uh, quality evaluation output, right? which is very nice. Uh, now, moreover, if you want to actually implement uh, say multiple uh, data sets uh, process multiple data sets through hdfs right it's pretty straightforward too in this case we are consuming our zero our one to our four in the same workflow in parallel and all you have to do here is again few lines of code by the way and as an aside i want to find out right as you can see uh, we, in quality evaluation cluster which is not even our production cluster we are processing around 2.5 billion in seven hours, which comes out to be more than 8 billion plus events per day in co our quality evaluation cluster. In our production cluster is much, much uh, bigger, like I mentioned. So that's an asset. But coming back to HTFS point, to do that, it's actually really straightforward code. All you have to do is uh, get this source multiple times and do a union. And one important point here is union doesn't do an in-place modification of the stream, which means you have to assign it back to original field for you to this particular thing, uh, the last line, uh, to uh, for it to actually take effect. Now, moving on to the next one, asynchronous processing, which is, I am pretty sure most of you are familiar with. We do use it for heavily for all our high latency path, uh, high latency components, including GraphDB, like I mentioned. And it's again, very straightforward and simple to implement in Flink, right? All you have to do is override async invoke, and then we pass it on to this async task handler. Right? And th that itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, we, we create a task and sub submit it into the executor service. In the task itself, we do the custom processing, and we simply do a result future dot complete to indicate to Flink that our processing is complete for one, and the second to pass on our output for downstream processing output from this component it's pretty straightforward and most of you should already be knowing about this going on to the next one the concurrency remember we process multiple billions of e events a day uh, with high parallelism it comes with it uh, it a lot of concurrency challenges too in particular to make it very concrete and stuff uh, at a very generic level in this sub path we process all events by device ID, right? But if the multiple events with the same device ID were to go to two different components, it has at least two problems, right? It can affect the correctness because the read up rate, right? And uh, right, uh, last rate wins and all that kind of uh, things. So if it goes into multiple threads of execution, it is going to affect our correctness because of race conditions. The second problem is performance degradation because of lock equation, lock equation failure, retrace, and so on. Right, so we could solve this very elegantly by making a, uh, this subpath keyed by our device ID, which guarantees that all these events go through a sequential flow or single flow of execution for all these events with the same device ID. Right, go through a sequential flow and the single flow thread of execution, which guarantees correctness for us by eliminating this condition, and it improves performance because. There are no lock equation failure because there are absolutely no locks to acquire, which is pretty elegant. And probably this is probably the second most important lesson I would say in this talk, right? And 
the what's more in flink it's really elegant and very simple to do right all you have to do is use a key by function which applies a function on top of your event and gives the key and then if everything with this all the events with the same key goes through a single sequential flow of execution which is really elegant and nice way to solve and greatly improve your performance right in the interest of time i'll skip these guys and uh, as a reminder again if you are more interested in how to evaluate the streaming uh, how did we do the streaming frameworks evaluation and finally ended up with flink not based on our intuition but based on our data feel free to look at our adobe tech blog just search for adobe and flink and as i said you could even use that methodology in our opinion for evaluating a db or lookup store technology right with that i'll stop and take question thanks a lot for joining again